Well, good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where in the world you are joining us from today. And welcome to June and the next IPERG webinar series. So for those of you who are not familiar with this series or who are perhaps joining us for the first time, I can give you a bit of background about it. Uh, if I could just have my next slide, please. So, just one moment. Uh, so this series was brought in to basically replace our annual meetings, which have had to be suspended due to COVID-19. We're having them monthly and they're free to access. You can find information about upcoming webinars on the IPERG website, and we're trying to pick topics of interest to our members. If you would like to give a webinar or you've got an idea for one, then please do email myself. I am Melanie Tuffin. I am the Secretary and Treasurer of IPERG, and you can reach me at melanie at mgtuffin.com. Because the presenters come from across the globe, sometimes we'll be having them in perhaps the morning your time, sometimes the afternoon, sometimes the evening. Presentations are between 20 and 40 minutes long, and we do make our recordings available on YouTube afterwards. You'll find there's a Q&A function, and you can use that to ask questions, but you can also just let us know where you're watching from today in the chat. So speaking of our YouTube channel, if you would like to subscribe to that, next slide, please. Uh, you can find us on YouTube. All the webinars go up on there afterwards, so they continue to be freely available. So today it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Katrina Duffy. So Katrina's background was originally in zoology at University College Dublin. And after her bachelor's of science, she carried out a master's in environmental impact assessment before starting her PhD in Irish Climate Analysis and Research Unit, Icarus, at Maynooth University, where she researched the impacts of climate change on agricultural insect pests. During this time, she also worked as a research assistant processing downscale climate scenarios for Ireland. Since her PhD, she's worked on a stock processing different types of data, including hydrological, climatological, and ecological, that's a lot of ologicals, and she's currently working as a postdoc assessing the effects of climate change on forestry species in Ireland. And today she's going to talk to us about hierarchical clustering work that we actually did together and how it can be used to identify potential pests of Sitka spruce in Ireland. So I'll hand over to Katrina. Thanks very much for the introduction, Melanie. Let's see if I can use the next slide here. All right, um, thanks very much everyone for having me to speak here today. Um, good morning or good evening, wherever it is that you may be. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about a paper that, as Melanie mentioned, I co-authored with her and two other colleagues from Maynooth University. Um, and that paper was concerning the application of hierarchical clustering uh, to pest data in order to identify high risk pests to Sitka spruce. So I'll give a very brief outline of the work, uh, the premise behind it, how it was carried out, as well as its outputs. And I'm also going to discuss how we dealt with pseudo absences within the data, as well as a basic climate analysis that was carried out on the resulting clusters. So um, Sitka spruce or Picea sicensis, it's the dominant tree species used in Irish forestry, and it makes up over 50% of our forest estate here in Ireland. Um, and currently Ireland is fairly free from most of the really damaging pests or pathogens of spruce found around Europe, uh, like the, the bark beetle lips to the graphis, for example. Um, now, as part of the, of the forum research project, I was part of a work package tasked with horizon scanning for new and emerging pest risks to Sitka spruce in Ireland, uh, specifically to complement the identification of the highest risk pests uh, for full-blown pest risk analyses to be carried out by Melanie. So a global list of spruce pests was compiled by um, Melanie and it identified over a thousand pests and potential pests of spruce. Now within this list, uh, the distribution of some pests was marked as uncertain if they fulfilled certain criteria and that's all outlined in Melanie's um, 2019 paper. 
Uh, but for example, if the species had been recorded in Ireland before, but there had been no records within, say, the last 30 years, uh, then it would be recorded as uncertain within that list. So as a result, uh, for the first iteration of the analysis that I'm going to show you here today, any pests whose presence in Ireland was listed as uncertain were coded as absent. Um, uh, so the data from this list was the basis for the analysis that I'm going to describe here. So this table shows the number of species identified within uh, the original pest list, and it's broken down by order. So this is my starting point for the hierarchical clustering. Uh, rare species firstly were removed in order to uh, remove any potentially overly influential data points. So a rare species was defined as a species that occurred in less than six regions across the globe. And then on the right side is the final groups that were actually utilized within the analysis. So um, I identified two different methods that would have been suitable for this type of analysis, um, hierarchical clustering and self-organizing maps. So I'll just cover the former for this discussion. And the premise behind using clustering for identifying high-risk pests is based on the pest assemblages of the region under analysis. So the pest assemblage is simply just the, the pests um, found in a specific order um, from a specific region. And the pest assemblage of an area or a region is the result of a multitude of biotic and abiotic factors. So you're talking about uh, the hosts, the environment, the, the climate that's found in that region. Now, these pest profiles or pest assemblages, they can act as a proxy for the biotic or abiotic factors in an area when you're attempting to group like or similar pest assemblages together. Um, so two regions that have the same pest assemblage are very likely to have similar characteristics. And this means that species that are present in one could or should, in theory, be able to establish in the other. So um, this facilitates the production of groupings of regions where the pest assemblages are similar. So this is a screenshot of the original data that Melanie compiled. Um, you can see it includes the name of pests and their distribution in different regions across the world. So the data set was analyzed using the MATLAB programming language and all of the regions listed as present for each species were coded as one and all of the absences and the uncertains were coded as zero. So this resulted in um, a binary presence absence data file for each order under analysis. So this is just an, a, a screenshot of one of them to show you what they look like. And these files were the final input into that hierarchical clustering analysis. So how does um, this clustering work? Uh, it starts by assigning each item to its own cluster so that if you have, uh, say, n items, you now have n clusters to start with and each one contains just one item. So next, the algorithm finds the most similar pair of clusters and merges them into a single cluster. So now you have one less cluster. And the algorithm measures similarity by um, computing the distances between the new cluster and each of the oldest clusters. So at each stage, two clusters emerge um, that provide the smallest increase in the combined sum of squared errors. So these steps are repeated on and on until all the items are clustered into a single cluster of the original size of the data that you started with. Now, um, the merge can be based on a number of different methods, but Ward's minimum variance method was utilized here um, purely because it produced interpretable clusters uh, for the data that it was being fed. Um, and it's been proven before to produce interpretable clusters in previous studies. So um, this graphic is just giving you an overview of the results of the hierarchical clustering. So it shows the breakdown of the clusters um, for each of the groups analyzed. So the Hymenoptera, Lepidoptera, Coleoptera, Hemiptera, Fungi, and Nematoda. So, what you can see straight away is all of the groups analyzed include a European or a Eurasian cluster. So this really highlights the similarity of pest assemblages that occurs within Europe, um, as well as their, their corollary um, climatic and environmental conditions. And for five out of the six groups interpreted, Ireland was included within the European cluster. So for all of them, except for the nematodes. And this indicates the potential for regions within this cluster to be donor regions of pests to Ireland. Um, a previous work uh, by um, Eshem, I think it was back in uh, 2014, uh, revealed similar groupings of European clusters for pests that were analysed. 
Um, the rest of the world cluster that you can see exhibited by the groups are clusters essentially that are defined by their absences of uh, pest species of Picea. So the majority of species in the analysis do not occur in these regions. And because of that, they form a big cluster um, because they're similar in their dissimilarity to the clusters whose production is based on presences within the assemblages. So they're the really large clusters that you can see in each one of those maps there that include Africa and South America. So um, they're just all similar because they have no uh, Picea uh, pest species. So this is one example close up for the Hemiptera. Um, it's showing the, the clustering. Um, it shows a very distinct European, North American, and that rest of the world cluster. So that's sort of a straightforward three cluster um, outcome. Now, it's not just maps that are produced by the hierarchical clustering. The analysis can also facilitate a quantification of the risk of establishment posed by the species analysed. Um, the assumption uh, was that the likelihood that a species is able to establish in, in Ireland is positively related to the frequency of occurrence in other countries in the cluster. Um, and that's due to the, because of the similarities that occur in the climate and environment. So for this analysis, we adopted it, the frequency of a species within the regions in a cluster as the indication of the likelihood of establishment um, in a country uh, in that cluster where it isn't present yet. So for this case, Ireland. So what this allows us to do is actually rank um, the pests that are found within a specific cluster from high to low risk for our target country, which is Ireland. So in the case of the Hemiptera, um, the spruce bud scales had been identified previously by Melanie as species um, that were quite important and potentially high risk for pest risk analysis for Ireland. And the HC analysis carried out here confirmed their importance um, in terms of risk for Ireland, or at least agreed that you know, they were showing up as high risk. Um, the mass produced from these uh, biological clusters can also be extremely intuitive in a physical way. Um, so you can see that from this example for the Coleoptera. So wait, straight off, you can see a partition um, of clusters between the eastern and western um, North America. So it's split into two different clusters straight along the, the Rocky Mountains. Again, you can see um, uh, there's sort of vertical, further physical meaning um, within the clusters. Where, the, where Europe and Asia are split by the Ural Mountains, so providing sort of a physical boundary to species uh, spreading. So these populations can't get past this physical barrier. Um, so it's quite nifty that, you know, this approach or this algorithm can pick up on um, those very real boundaries that exist for species. OK, so in order to investigate the potential for under recording of species distribution to influence the cluster outcomes. I reran the analysis with all instances of the species marked as uncertain recorded in the distribution, recoded to present. So the same approach, everything was used as before. Um, and the analysis was reran, only this time uncertain was now present instead of absent. And um, for the majority, there were no differences in the groups analyzed, with the exception of the nematodes and the fungi. So for the nematodes, um, Ireland moved into the European cluster and for the fungi, the Netherlands and Denmark moved out of the European cluster containing Ireland. So what you can see here is a, um, a comparison of uh, the nematodes when they were run uh, with uncertain coded as absent in the top map and then uncertain coded as present in the bottom. So. Um, in the top map there, uh, originally the nematodes were, they were quite difficult to interpret. Um, when I examined the, the data that was going into the nematodes further, uh, it revealed that the split between uh, cluster one and two in the top map, it was really heavily influenced by the presence of just three species. And all of them were achieving like really high uh, risk index. Um, so the presence of these three species together was the driving force behind the grouping of um, the, all the states there in um, the US and cluster one. Uh, so what this is saying is that a very small number of species can actually have a very uh, an influential um, effect on the clusters that are produced. So 
In the original iteration, only a single nematode from the pest distribution list was confirmed as present in Ireland. So this explains why Ireland failed to cluster with the rest of Europe um, in the first iteration or in the top map. And this is partly explained by um, the poor records that we have here um, for nematode species. Uh, we have no official list of species, and this um, led to the recording of many of the species originally as uncertain. Now, it's equally possible that a number of the nematode species in the list are in fact present, and that Ireland's emission from the European cluster in the first part of the analysis is a direct result of their under recording. So the inclusion of the uncertain species um, produces a European cluster which includes Ireland, and this really serves to highlight how sensitive uh, this analysis can be to underrepresentation of a group. So it's something to be very careful of. Okay, so um, so the final part of the analysis involved um, a look at the climates of the cluster produced. So uh, climate is inherently incorporated into the approach um, used here. So to further investigate the relationship between the clusters produced and um, the typical climate for a region, the climate types for each of the clusters were assessed using the Koppen classification scheme. So this classification scheme uses seasonal temperature and precipitation to distinguish uh, 31 different climate types. Um, that's one of the most widely applied climate classification schemes used, um, probably because it's, it's accepted, it's generally accepted um, ecological relevance of the classifications that, that are in it. So as you can see from the map here, Ireland has a temperate oceanic climate, so CFB. And that's one of the primary types from Sika's native range. So that's not entirely surprising, um, considering that we, we grow it so well here. So um, dominant climate types uh, per cluster in each group were calculated, and they're displayed here in heat maps for each of the groups. So the climate types are on the y-axis, and the cluster numbers are on the x-axis there. And the cluster that contains Ireland are boxed in in red. And then each of the legends just indicating that um, it's percentages that are being shown for each climate type. So for each of the groups, um, the European cluster contains many of the climate classifications that were originally identified from the native range. So for example, excuse me, for the fungal group, the dominant Koppen classifications are those where Sika spruce is found. So um, CFB 25%, DFB 29% and DFC uh, was 34%. So that suggests a really strong relationship that exists between the species included in the analysis and their Picea hosts. Um, high DFB, which is, sorry, humid continental and DFC, which is subarctic, across all of the Irish clusters are also indicative of uh, the native range of Norway spruce, which is another host for many of the Zika pests um, that were included in the original uh, pest list and analyzed here. So it was just an, an interesting aside. Okay, so um, some of the conclusions. For five out of the six groups that were interpreted, Ireland was included within the European cluster. So indicating that um, the potential for regions within this cluster to be donor regions of pests to Ireland. So essentially what this means is that our highest risk pests are most likely to come from our European neighbours than anywhere else. That's according to, to this approach. Um, the rest of the world cluster um, was produced by the absence of spruce pests. Um, so the presence absence data for these absent clusters predominantly display zeros. And this highlights the fact that there are very few pests of Picea found in these regions. And this makes sense considering the distribution of spruce globally. It's just not something that um, I had anticipated before I ran the actual analysis. Um, the analysis is very sensitive to underrepresentation of a group. So we saw that with the example of the nematodes. So in the uncertain mass marked as present iteration, the inclusion of the uncertain species produced the European cluster um, for the nematode that included Ireland. Now, whether this is due to under-recording or genuine absences of these species in Ireland, 
Um, the sensitivity shown here highlights the importance of good quality data for analyses like these. So um, I'm sure you can all appreciate when it comes to models, if you put rubbish in, you get rubbish out. So it's really important to, um, to quality check the data as much as possible and to get the best quality data for analyses like these if you really hope to um, achieve realistic clustering um, outcomes. Um, informal testing of um, an optimal data size was inconclusive. Um, so I had considered whether or not a potential cutoff or a limit might exist within the data set size instead, you know, before I, whereas I know this is definitely a data quality issue. So um, where the clusters would remain stable once a critical number of species was incorporated. Uh, I tested this informally for each of the groups by running the cluster analysis um, for the cluster solutions identified for each group, wherein a single species was removed on each, each iteration. So the premise being that a stable cluster solution might actually exist uh, once a specific number of species was incorporated. So, you know, is there actually a critical number of uh, data that needs to be included? Um, but a single critical size of input data wasn't identified. Um, uh, for each group, the amount of species data required for the clusters to stabilize or remain relatively unchanged changed depending on what group um, I was examining. So this really suggested that the size of the data set is less important than the data that it contains. So this just highlights again the importance of reliable uh, available data if this sort of approach is to be truly useful. Um, overall, the outputs indicate that the approach is useful at identifying biologically coherent groups based on pest assemblage data. So HC can be used for prioritizing species for evaluation as potential alien pests to uh, sick as bruise in Ireland or for other target regions. Okay, and uh, thank you. Questions or comments? Thank you very much. Please remember, if you'd like to ask a question, to so do it via the Q&A function rather than via the chat function. But perhaps I could just kick off and ask a question. So earlier in the talk, you were talking about the risk index. Um, and I wondered, does that sort of provide a risk for all of the species in the analysis or just the ones sort of grouped in a cluster? All right, yeah, um, no, it, it doesn't provide indications of uh, the risk or the likelihood of establishment for species that haven't been recorded in cluster in countries within the cluster. Um, I didn't consider this necessarily a drawback um, because the species within the cluster represent sort of the, the climatic conditions, the ecology or the, the trade history as well of the cluster regions. So regions that are not in the cluster will display different biotic and abiotic conditions and uh, as such constitute a lower risk of being um, a donor of alien species. So essentially the threat from those species um, whose risk index is not supplied is lower because of the different climates found in other regions. And secondly, um, because the focus was on Ireland, we're really only interested in uh, the species that shared a cluster with um, Ireland as a country. Um, because they're the ones that are of interest um, in relation to being high risk of establishment. OK, thank you very much. OK, so let's just go on to the next question. So you had this rest of the world cluster and you sort of define that as being a cluster that sort of represents the absence of pests of spruce. So should we really be including those countries as part of the actual uh, clustering analysis? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it could be up for debate for sure. Uh, I think though that their inclusion is pretty important, um, probably for two reasons, because firstly, they, they can provide a benchmark assemblage against which the other pest assemblages characterized by presences can be compared. So if the absent clusters weren't included, then the dissimilarity between the remaining countries would be altered, as would the resultant clusters. Um, so it can have an effect on the outcome. And secondly, I, really, I think that, you know, removing countries based on any number of presences uh, sort of it'd be entirely arbitrary and it could really confound the production of any sort of robust outputs from the analysis. 
So it's always a bit dangerous, I think, to start removing data before you know what sort of impact it's, it's having. Okay, thank you very much. So I think it's probably a bit early because I don't think we actually have any other questions at the moment, but I do just want to take the opportunity uh, to thank Katrina once again for joining us and to ask all of you to join us next month. So keep an eye out uh, for an email and on our social media channels, we'll be making an announcement about our next webinar soon. So thank you very much, Katrina, and have a good rest of the day or evening wherever you are. Okay, bye-bye for now.